Now, your electrifying hosts of Exploring the Bazaar, Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz. Uh, keep your voice down. Don't even whisper. You know they say the walls have ears. But I, I don't understand. What are we doing here in the headquarters of the CIA in Langley? We're posing as agents so we can go through their files and see if they have any information on the supposed suicide of James Forrestal, Secretary of Defense under President Truman. Oh, oh, I remember that. He went head down into the pavement, he fell, jumped, or was pushed out of a window. I know that officially it was a suicide. They said he had a nervous breakdown, but uh, there's a lot of people, including our guest tonight, think that it was murder. Yep. Supposedly, he was on the board of the MJ-12 group, formed shortly after the UFO crash at Roswell. Okay, well, I say we tiptoe the hell out of here and get back to the KCOR studio before some spook throws us out the window. All right, put your sunglasses back on and your black hat, and let's, let's head out the door. Just be quiet. Okay. Well, we're out of there. Did anybody follow us? Well, it's hard It's hard to say. We've always got somebody following us. Somebody's <laughs> always watching me. <laughs> Maybe you. Well, because... Nobody wants, nobody wants to watch. Too. Nobody wants to watch me. I'm, I'm the handsomer of the two. Yeah, there you go. No, nah, not, not really. Hey, I got a bone to pick tonight. Okay. All right. with, with somebody. This BS by Mark Schmuckelberg from <laughs> Facebook really irritated the hell out of me today. He, okay. He's on TV see, saying that he's against censorship <laughs> and nobody should be censored. Well, he's a bold-faced liar, Tim. <laughs> and you know why? You know why, right? We yep. can't even post a link to the conspiracy journal on Facebook because it goes against community standards. Mm. What community standards is that? We talk about Bigfoot and UFOs and time travel. What the hell is wrong with that? He's got some problem with Bigfoot. Well, Bigfoot should shove his foot up where the sun don't shine. <laughs> Uh, I agree. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not, uh, it's, it's, so, it's so, somebody it, ought to, somebody ought to fact check his ass. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, to go on television and to say that, you know, that yeah. they're, they're against censorship when yeah. you, know, you, you, you find your own stuff. And, and, and you know, censored, so. oh, okay, all right. I, I, you know, I, I have a publication, right? We have many uh, publications. The Conspiracy right. Journal being one. I do the the print edition, and you do the a weekly edition, which is available for free. Right. Okay, and we don't. Uh, I call it soft conspiracy, right? We don't really sure. get into nine eleven. Uh, we're not uh, uh, too much into uh, the. Um, Bilderbergers, although I don't see where that's a, bi a big a problem. The group exists. They meet every year, all these big wigs, and they have satanic rituals. And Henry Kissinger runs around nude. What's wrong with that? <laughs> they ought to just they they ought to they ought to just admit to it. I mean, I don't I don't know. You know, I, I mean, don't know. It I, sounds like a weekend here in Jasper. You know, yeah. And, and <laughs> And, you know, if, if if David Icke wants to get on YouTube and rave and rant that the Queen is a reptilian, well, you know, I want to ask Peter, uh, our guest tonight, about that, because I'm, I, I'm very suspicious. She's always wearing yellow and green, which seems to me they are the colors of the, the, the serpents, of, of, of reptiles. Maybe I'm wrong, but... Uh, Peter's uh, sister, the famous punk rock uh, singer, performer, Helen Wheels, had a boa constrictor. So I don't remember what color it was, but uh, I don't know. It's, it's very suspicious. So if David Icke wants to rave and rant about the uh, the queen, well, that's fine with uh, me. I, I don't know. I mean, I just I just think it's a it, it, it's up to the person to 
to decide what they want to believe. If you want to put a warning on the bottom and say the queen is not a reptilian by uh, community standards, well, that's okay too. But to shut somebody down because they have something outrageous to say, well, people in politics on both sides of the aisle, they always have something outrageous to say too. <laughs> anyway, I, I'm, I, I'm, you know, I, I've just had, I, I just had to bring that up because I think that it's despicable and I'm sure he'll throw us off of Facebook now for good. <laughs> yeah, not like I spend that much time on yeah. Facebook to be, to begin with, but, uh, uh, Tim, well, got, our, uh, our, I got 5,000 friends. Yeah, that's right. And I'm, and I'm, yeah. I'm closing in pretty rapidly myself. Yeah. Uh, and, to, and so they should decide they should decide what if my community standards are not their community standards they can always defriend me or unfriend <laughs> me or, or 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 whatever because i i unfriend some of them <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway humbug bs and so forth and so on and let's talk about tonight's show Right. Well, tonight, Tim, uh, I'm really happy that uh, we have a return visit from our very good friend, Peter Robbins. Peter's been on uh, our show a number of times, and it's always a real pleasure uh, when he is with us. Really quick, Peter Robbins is an investigative writer, author, and lecturer, best known for his UFO-related papers, columns, articles, editorials, commentaries, lectures, and media appearances. He's a regular fixture on radio and has appeared as a guest and has been a consultant to numerous television shows and documentaries. Now, Peter, uh, born in New York City and studied art, design, and theater at the University of Bridgeport in Connecticut, receiving his uh, BFA, painting and film. Film history from New York City's School of Visual Art, where he taught painting for more than a dozen years. So, Peter, great to have you back with us on Exploring the Bazaar. Good evening, Tim and Tim, and it's very happy to be back on the show. Well, we just gave you a wonderful introduction. That mentioned nothing about UFOs, but we can make that up as we go along. Well, yes, but we we want to. We're, we're into that. Yeah, you know, I'm actually working on a book. Uh, in fact, I'm using some of your material in it. It's <laughs> called The uh, CIA Matrix and the Deep State. All kinds of conspiracies. I, you know, I take no side when it, I take no side when it, <laughs> I take no side when it comes to conspiracies. The whole world, the whole world is a conspiracy as far as I'm, uh, uh, I'm concerned, you know, uh, but anyway, why, why don't you tell us a little bit, uh, you know, maybe, not everybody listening to the program was around when Truman was president and, <laughs> and when James Forrestal was the secretary of defense and this rather suspicious, suspicious and tragic event took place. Why didn't you set the stage for us, but keep away from that window? Well, um, yeah, I, I'll do that. Um, James Forrestal was a remarkable and remarkably decent American. He uh, rose from very modest circumstances, uh, born in the late uh, 19th century in upstate New York, um, went on to uh, a university education at Dartmouth and Princeton, uh, enlisted in the United States um, Army right toward the end of the First World War, uh, trained to be a... Uh, a pilot um, with the RAF in Canada. The war ended before he could do that. He returned to America, but not to Princeton, and instead went to Wall Street and began to follow the American dream to make money and live the good life. He uh, did very well in business, met and married a uh, editor at Vogue magazine, former Ziegfeld showgirl, uh, prospered, and um, was one of the few heads of any brokerage house uh, to manage to keep them afloat after the crash of 1929 and into the Depression. Mm -hmm. He was um, cultured, he was well-read, he was a passionate amateur sportsman, a professional level tennis player and golfer, um, uh, amateur boxer, and um, had a very savvy head for business. He was also extremely charismatic and in working on background material for this documentary, um, which is a very modest kind of personal project, 
but it is the result of uh, more than 30 years of research on and off. That's the way it is sometimes in this field. He uh, was brought to the attention of President Roosevelt uh, during the Depression by a former classmate at Princeton who went on to become a very successful banker, a man named Ferdinand Eberstadt. Uh, Roosevelt was impressed with his credentials, and Forrestal was invited to move to Washington for the duration of the Depression, uh, was the way that it usually worked, and joined a cadre of basically white millionaire successful businessmen who worked at the pleasure of the president to help advise him on getting the country out of the Depression for a dollar a year. They were euphemistically called the dollar a year men or the kitchen cabinet. Uh, a bit of a pun on the regular cabinet. Um, he took the call to public service extremely seriously. And where other individuals that were advising Roosevelt did return to their private lives as the economy got better, he never left Washington after that, really. Um, in the years leading up to World War II, he was appointed uh, Under Secretary of Navy. Um, and then toward the end of World War uh, II, when the Secretary of Navy, Frank Knox, had a heart attack and died, he became the Secretary of Navy. He was an ultimate team player, um, a true patriot. And I, that word is so bandied about these days by people who really have no right to use it or minimally. Uh, he was the real deal. And um, he also thrived in high stress atmospheres. He must have driven some of his underlings at the Pentagon crazy because he kept putting himself in harm's way. Uh, as the Secretary of Navy, he was at the Battle of Leyte Gulf, Iwo Jima, um, uh, Tokyo Bay, uh, and a number of others. He was a very hands-on guy. Uh, April 1945, President Truman die, uh, Roosevelt dies and, President, and Vice President Truman becomes president. Uh, at the conclusion of the war, Truman um, charges Forrestal with um, a very challenging uh, mission. He wants him to take the old War Department, which had been in place since the American Revolution. It was a cabinet-level position. Dismantle it and create a new entity that would be called the Department of Defense. And ultimately, as it opened in September, uh, well, and as he took office in September of uh, 1947, it also incorporated the newest service branch, the United States Air Force. Uh, he created the Defense Department, again, as an individual, literally, um, without benefit of working as part of a committee. Uh, the infighting was pretty ferocious, and he handled it very well. Not surprisingly, upon completion, President Truman nominated him to become the first Secretary of Defense. Uh, imagine this happening in our modern Washington. Uh, he was um, elected by, well, and confirmed by acclamation. Every single senator and congressman approved his nomination. And he was sworn in. Well, that wouldn't uh, happen today, would it? Oh, yeah. It happens all the time <laughs> now, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, that's, that's how much respect he engendered from not just the, uh, uh, the legislature branch and the president and the military, but the people of the United States. Um, my mother uh, told me in her reflections of remembering him as a teenager that Everybody thought the world of him, and we, who knows how long, much longer the war would have taken without his dedication and, and extraordinary service. This is where the story crosses into territory that we're more familiar with. And I should say, Tim and Tim, that in creating this, um, again, it's a one-person documentary. It's me with a green screen and a lot of images and some nice music, uh, film clips. Um, on the surface, it appears um, very tame. Um, it suggests the kind of um, little film that could be shown for a fraternal organization, a high school uh, history class, or in a church basement. But I have to say, I think it's the most methodical, controlled, subversive project I've ever been involved in. In that, my goal was to 
you know, if people in the UFO field like it, that's great. Um, but I aimed it at everybody else in the world. I wanted to find a story that was mm-hmm. absolutely true that I could document that was so compelling. Um, I compare him to F. Scott Fitzgerald's um, The Great Gatsby. He was an incredibly self-made man, and again, Kennedy-esque in his uh, uh, charisma. And by the time we get to the summer of 1947, my hope is that a regulation issue, you know, sort of straight audience is so caught up in the story that when I mention late July, first of uh, late June, the first of July or so, an object of undetermined origin crashes in the plains uh, several dozen miles from a small town at that time called Roswell, New Mexico, and I go on. But imagine what was waiting for him on his desk the day he first appeared on his first day as Secretary of Defense. We know that from the original eight-page MJ-12 briefing document, and as you guys know, there's like a zillion documents alleging to be MJ-12. I think... um, I think a great many of them, to be kind, are not so much, you know, typed up in somebody's basement. I think they're extraordinary, sophisticated disinformation, making them almost as interesting in their own way as if they were real. And I may be wrong there, but I am convinced, as was a mentor of mine, um, somebody we all looked up to in ufology, who we lost last year, and who was something of a scholar on the subject, Stanton T. Friedman, that that eight-page briefing document um, to President-elect Eisenhower that names those 12 men, uh, Forrestal was number three, and he would have certainly been the right man to choose in his area of expertise. But if you read the, um, the job description for Secretary of Defense, in reality, it is the second most powerful position in the United States. Technically, the vice president becomes president, but while he's still vice president, the secretary of defense can make policy. And in the case of Truman and Forrestal, everything that Truman was learning, everything that he knew about this growing concern about this um, unidentified flying disc phenomena, Forrestal knew. Now, where some of the poignancy and natural and well-documented drama of what goes from being a Horatio Alger story and a great American success story into a true Greek, Greek tragedy is having read literally everything over the decades written by Forrestal, the few books published about Forrestal, and you know me, Tim, I'm a book nut and um even going back to the 80s, I was haunting used bookstores for out-of-print mm. memoirs by everyone who knew him. Go to the index, mark mm. the pages, and, you know, do it old school. Um, I worked for uh, several years on and off in the New York Times newspaper morgue, pulling up every article. Uh, our wonderful main branch, uh, New York City Public Library in the Rose Reading Room. I'd come and go for it, you know, uh, coming well, well, from it over the years. Well, now, Peter, let, let me ask you something. In any of the documents or papers that you saw, was the word UFO ever used in association with him? Oh, never. Never. And that is not surprising. For, well, first of all, the term UFO did not come into use yeah, until yeah. 1956. Yeah. You're but, absolutely correct, yes. Yeah, but no, um, it, it was beautifully controlled, and um, everybody kind of insulated themselves in their memoirs, etc. cetera. Um, but what happens here is what we need to know Um about James Forrestal personally, and there's a a brilliant and unique book written about him in the early 60s called James Forrestal, um, I think a study in in personality, I've got it right here, James James Forrestal, a study of personality, politics, and policy. I won't call them character flaws, but he had two aspects to his personality that really were part of his undoing. Number one, um, as the kind of guy who, you know, as they used to say about Kennedy and other charismatic people, the kind of guy when he'd walk into a room, 
all the guys wanted to have a drink with him and all the women wanted to sleep with him. This was James Barstall. He seemed to have a pathological inability to allow any of his many friends and acquaintances to get too close. He was walled off inside and can get psychological and discuss the reasoning, but he was that way. More destructive was he habitually, from the time he was young, personalized not just his successes, which is not a bad thing, but his failures. If you, if the three of us were what working what we'd laughingly call regular straight office jobs, ha ha ha, and we had a very bad day at the office, uh, got balled out by the boss, screwed up an order, cost the company money, you know, you leave the work with your tail between your legs, you go home, you kiss your wife, your husband, your dog, whatever, you watch some TV, you have a drink, you have dinner, resolve to do better the next day, go to bed and go back. <clears throat> He could not let this go. And what it came down to was from the time he took office in September of 47 until the day that he stepped down in March of 49, in his heart and in his efforts, he knew that even though he was heading the most powerful military establishment, not counting whatever was going on in Mua Lamora or, you know, uh, Atlantis or something, but in, in, you know, modern history, so to say, he, he couldn't crack it. He didn't, he couldn't get us any closer to an answer and it ate him up inside. And um, before we go to break, I'll just say that he, he, he walled that off. You know, you can look at his face and see it's tight as a drum in photographs of that period, but he was able to stave it until literally the afternoon that he stepped down and that the second secretary of defense, uh, kind of a political hack, but uh, gave a lot of money to the party named Lewis K. Johnson took over. And this is where the story rolls into uh, a tragedy. All right. Well, this is a good place to, uh, to stop because Tim and Peter, unfortunately we are at our bottom of the hour break. So when we come back, We'll continue our conversation with Peter Robbins on Exploring the Bazaar, so stay tuned for more. Now back to Exploring the Bazaar with two of the most electrifying researchers in the paranormal, your hosts, Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz. And welcome back to Exploring the Bazaar. I'm Tim Swartz. Tonight, our guest is Peter Robbins, and we're talking about the uh, strange death of James Forrestal. Now, uh, Peter, uh, you have uh, mentioned uh, from the last uh, segment uh, a, a documentary that you've produced about this. Where can people see this documentary? Uh, has it been released yet? Um, they can come to my home and see it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, it will be out soon. Um, as Tim knows, um, we have been good buddies for decades. And I am not the most practical person, but I mean well. I am sincere and I'm a good researcher. And I did this um, with passion first, accuracy, of course. What I neglected to do was make notes on every single one of the 150 odd images I've, you know, searched for and found in various archives and online and in books. The newspaper images, I'm fine with. They move into the public domain very quickly. But there are other images that are owned by archives or whatever. And so I am now going through the process of retracing the ownership of any photographs that at this level of the game, it may be a $25 fee here or a similar one there. But over the next few weeks, I will be sorting it out. And then, and I'll certainly let you guys know. And beforehand, uh, I'll, I'll send you uh, a secured link so that you can watch it on your own. Because I don't want that to get out there. Once it's on YouTube, that product is dead in the water. And I really don't have any books out right now for reasons you guys know. To cut to the chase, though... Um, Within a few weeks, um, it will be uh, available for streaming, and um, I'm very proud of the fact that when the DVD comes out, 
It will have um, uh, optional English subtitles for the hearing impaired uh, and also um, sp optional Spanish language subtitles. Uh, my <clears throat> wonderful producers and I are um, going to be looking at how this thing moves out into the world and um, if there is interest in other countries we will consider that the next edition has additional subtitles in different languages. Um, I'm very proud of it. Um, I think it's a it's good grounded stuff and maybe most important it can act to bring people who would never watch a UFO documentary or video or DVD or go to a UFO conference to set a story very well documented in post-war American history that dovetails into the hardcore early days of the cover-up of the UFO, truly anomalous UFO phenomena. And if they can then see, my God, these are real documents, and the timeline works, and I see here that this is the hospital records and what have you, you know what, maybe there's something to it, and now I'm intrigued and want to learn more. That, for me, I would consider a great victory. We have a question from uh, one of our listeners, Cosmonaut57. Uh, um, he wants to know about the uh, specifics of the big secret that uh, got uh, Forrestal killed. Uh, he says, uh, what was that exactly? Can you be more specific than of just course. UFO secrets? <laughs> yeah. Well, number one, it wasn't UFO secrets that got him killed near mm -hmm. as I can figure. The basic thing we have to remember here, and it's not exotic, paranoid, or conspiratorial, it's just the way the world is now and was then. I think it's fair to say that the three of us, and I'm going to, I bet money on the fact that every one of your listeners, unless they've been living in a cave their whole lives somewhere in the Himalayas, <laughs> either themselves or a family member or a friend or a business associate, or somebody that they grew up with, or somebody they have met and known, at one time or another in their lives has consulted a therapist, seen a psychiatrist, uh, been to um, a, a psychologist, um, needed counseling of one kind or another. It's just the way the modern world is. It was exactly the opposite in 1949. I'd bet one American in 100, if not 500, knew somebody who was quote unquote in therapy or seeing a mental health professional. Unless say you were some society person and uh, you went to Vienna to be you know, psychoanalyzed by a protege of Freud's. We're dealing here with not just an alpha male high up in the American government, but next to Truman, um, as alpha male as they get, the man who knew all the secrets, who was privy to not just some of or most of what we were learning from the summer of 1947 into the spring of 1949, he knew everything Truman knew. And the fact that he was charged with the responsibility for Getting to the bottom of this, um, the Eisenhower briefing document comes with a one-page letter purporting to be from Truman to Forrestal. It's brief, it's terse, and it's to the point, and essentially it says, you know, fulfill this mission, and Forrestal tried his damnedest, but again, even with the resources that he had at hand, he couldn't deliver anything concise, cohesive, and definitive to the president. Uh, for another person, they might have been depressed or disappointed in themselves, but hey, you know, when I leave here, I'll write my memoirs and live a cushy life. It broke him. It broke him. He felt that his life was a total failure. Now, here's the crux of it. The men around Truman, and a lot of them were very tough, no-nonsense individuals. All of them knew that they had had this breath of fresh air in the summer of 1945. We were, the United States of America at that moment in history was what we dream of and wish we were now. We had saved, helped to save the world from Nazism, fascism, make it safe for democracy, 
we had done something amazing, established the Marshall Plan, whereby we gave billions of dollars in our aid, of aid to our two biggest enemies, the Japanese and the Germans. No one had ever done this in history, really. And we helped them rebuild, and we can look now and say, very decent societies dedicated to not going to war and taking care of their people. What we did was remarkable, but we knew we were facing Something might even be worse. Uh, our recent um, allies in the war, uh, Stalin and the Soviet Union, um, hardcore communism, we were looking right down the gun barrel of potential nuclear war, and ultimately that did not happen. We had a cold war instead of a hot war. But Forrestal understood all this, and for the men around Truman, who knew, knew nobody who had ever had a nervous breakdown. You know, maybe guys in combat cracked up, but that was something else. You know, nervous breakdowns are for girls and, you know, sissies and real men and certainly a real man like Forrestal, no way. But they all knew it happened. And I am convinced that what got him killed was their genuine concern that if he quote-unquote recovered, and believe me, I mean, well, believe the information I put forward. Uh, I have seen hospital records, read the commentaries of his doctors, of the people closest to him who visited him in the hospital, his brother, Truman, etc. He was recovering, and he was scheduled for discharge on May 22nd, 1949, a Sunday. Uh, his brother was going to pick him up at Bethesda Naval Hospital, and he was going to complete his recovery. Uh, at the estate of a wealthy friend, um, and then go into private life. But they he never, he never, he never made it out of the hospital. He didn't. Well, he did, but not the way you'd want to. Um, yes, yes. Okay. But what it came down to was, and it took me years to try to put myself in their place. And for me, they were ultimate villains, and I didn't even want to try. But in their minds, if he quote unquote recovered, was wasn't it possible that he might have a relapse? And if he did, allegorically at least, he knew where all the bodies were buried. He knew everything about the UFO phenomena, which was now classified above top secret. They couldn't risk it. Um, I use uh, an aphorism that I like to credit to a mafia hitman before he shoots you in the back of the head twice with a 22 silenced pistol. It's nothing personal. It's just business. And I think it came down to that. He couldn't be allowed to live. Now, there's a lot of myths and rumors and legends that he was going to blow open the UFO story, that, uh, you know, the aliens controlled his mind. And it's wonderfully depicted in, in um, the terrific movie Roswell. Um, who knows? But what we do know is that back then, at that level of the game, it was just you know, a business decision on a certain level, he couldn't, they couldn't take the chance. Uh, I wish it were more exotic, but it's not. And it's not out of the question that... Oh, well, why, why, don't, why don't you tell, the, it's a cliffhanger here, what exactly happened to him? Because I'm sure a lot of listeners yeah, of don't know the end of the uh, yeah. uh, episode. Yeah. Well, what happened was, um, and I realize we're coming into the last 15 minutes here. Yeah, right? yes. yes. Yeah, I often <laughs> use extra words, so I'll speak quick. Um, there was a ceremony when he stepped down at the Pentagon and the second uh, Secretary uh, of Defense took office um, in the courtyard and in the Oval Office where um, President Truman awarded him the highest civilian decoration, Presidential Medal of Freedom or whatever it was. And we have a film strip of it. I mean, it's part of recorded history. There's the president pinning this... Uh, metal on his lapel and what we know is that he then Forrestal then stepped to the microphone and the room is filled with people all very adoring and respecting of him and what he said quote unquote was it's beyond my and then just stared off into space uh, Clark Clifford uh, who was uh, a young intern at the Department of Defense at the time and went on to become a future um, attorney general said it was obvious to everybody that this man was really in trouble. Um, shortly thereafter, he disappeared out of the room. There was a search of the Pentagon. They ultimately found him in his office, staring at the wall, repeating the phrase, you are a loyal fellow. Uh, nobody knew what to do, really. And he was escorted out into the area in front of the Pentagon, 
where it was Van of our Bush, MJ-12 number two, as I recall, uh, the president's science and technology advisor, his um, um, chauffeur saw Forrestal there and gave him a ride back to his townhouse in Georgetown. Forrestal called Epperstadt, a very close friend and the man who had introduced him to Roosevelt, and um, told him he felt his whole life was a failure and he was thinking of killing himself. Eberstadt went to the house. He was shocked at how badly he looked. Um, we know that Eberstadt and um, Robert Lovett, uh, a then deputy secretary of defense, went on to become another secretary of defense, flew him. Well, um, um, they flew him to Lovett's estate in Hobie Sound, Florida, uh, where the man was beside himself, and they locked him in a room overnight. Um, called, uh, you know, um, Bethesda, uh, the top psychiatrist for the Navy came, but he refused to examine him that night because the psychiatrist that the family chose, the um, uh, famous Midwestern um, psychiatrist, uh, I'm blanking on his name at the moment, but very famous clinician, wouldn't be there till the next day. They agreed that he should be institutionalized, and as a former Secretary of Navy, um, he went to Bethesda. He literally tried to throw himself out of the moving car on the way to the airfield. Um, for me, this is a mark, not that he was, you know, cuckoo, it was a mark that Forrestal knew that they wanted to kill him, that like a good Roman soldier, he was trying to throw himself on his sword. And it's beyond tragic. I document like th three suicide attempts in 48 hours before he is institutionalized. The first few weeks, he is held in his room where he was the whole time on the 16th floor, 24-hour day, Marine guard shift, and three eight-hour shifts. And then after a few weeks, they simply begin to treat him for depression in the manner prescribed at that time. I think we can assume safely that none of the doctors treating him knew anything about the flying saucers or the cover-up or whatever. They just treated him as a VIP patient, and uh, he restarted to respond, uh, regained his will to live, um, gained back weight, uh, started to take pride in his appearance, uh, was looking forward to completing his recovery privately. And that's when the forces that be um, had to finish the job for him. So I know the story has been spun a billion times, and um, it's, it's that tragically simple, I think, after 30 years of looking at it from every angle that I can. What I do um, in the documentary that I won't have time to go into here, but that I'm really proud of, is I revert to that little lawyer. We all have one living in our head on the left side, and I present the evidence. And some of it will make your jaw drop. Um, researchers, investigators, journalists who came before me did an extraordinary job of putting the pieces together, but it's never been fully brought out in a cohesive manner, although though I've read many good essays on it over the decades. Uh, I think this is the first documentary, even though it's a modest one, on him. And um, once he was gone, um, two days later, um, a full military uh, funeral at Arlington National Cemetery, 5,000 in attendance, 19 howitzer salute, uh, President Truman reads a eulogy, and he's forgotten by Americans over the next few years. And there is no reason to not accept why they didn't accept, I mean, why they did accept so easily that he had committed suicide. He was considered and a war what casualty. Date, what, what date was that that he uh, committed He um, died uh, early on the morning um, of May 22nd, 1949, which was a Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. And I think was buried on uh, the 25th, perhaps. Um, even my mom, remembering back to those days when I was thinking about doing this project, but, you know, I, my parents are wonderful people and remember this time well, um, she said, for me, um, this was for me as a high school student 
what the murder of John Kennedy was for you as a boy. Um, mm -hmm. We love this guy. And again, we felt that he had genuinely helped us win the war. And uh, I really looked up to him as um, a teenager. Now, was there ever uh, any kind of uh, congressional hearing or anything on this? Well, what happened to him was the Navy, of course, was compelled to conduct a quote-unquote investigation, which officially they said they ended after doing extensive investigation for five friggin' days. And what we now know, of course, was that it was a much deeper investigation, except that it was classified for decades. It was released um, about mm, early in the 2000s. It's long. It's very, very guarded, but it's fascinating. Interviewing witnesses, it goes to extraordinary um, lengths to say nobody was responsible for anything. It was just this freak thing. Um, happens all the time. Yes, it looked like he was almost fully recovered, but he found the door to his room accidentally unlocked at a quarter of two in the morning and decided to walk across the hallway to an efficiency kitchen with an unsecured window. And in that eight seconds, he went into a suicidal depression, took the sash off his bathrobe, tied one end very tight around his own neck. Mm. The uh, original report which was dismissed, the original allegations, was that he tied the other end to the radiator in, yes, in front yeah. of the window. But that was even uh, dismissed within 48 hours by the T New York Times, a terrific lead investigator. It wasn't tied to anything. We have to believe that he wanted, well, he wanted to hang himself out of window. No, he just wanted to tie the thing around his neck, lower himself out the window, then change his mind. How do we know he changed his mind? Fingernail scratches all over the outside window jam on the 16th floor. That is brutal. And that is not some arcane fact I had to research for years. That was in the coverage of the, um, I think it was um, May 23rd, um, the next day or the day after that, uh, lead investigative article by the lead uh, investigative journalist for the New York Times. It was so obvious that he was forced out of that window. Um, and that would mean that at least two men, properly credentialed, entered the hospital building, certainly sometime after midnight, could have been after one, um, maybe in white coats, maybe with name tags, made their way up to the 16th floor without any problem with security. Um, that his attendant, who normally would have been on that shift, who was a young Marine, who Forrestal um, had gotten particularly close to over the preceding weeks. In fact, there was some talk that um, after he was discharged, he was going to hire this man after he left the service to be his secretary. That's how close he started to think of him like a son. The official story is he simply didn't show up for work that night. Maybe he was drunk. Sorry, it would have never happened. Um, an attendant named Harbison, a regular hospital attendant, was charged with checking in on him. And I in no way mean to suggest even that Harbison was, you know, um, some dupe or, you know, uh, evil person. He was just stuck with the job. Whether or not he forgot to lock that door or after he left, it was unlocked. The other thing is we have a few photos of the room taken within... We know the photos were taken um, within a few hours of uh, the murder, and it's the room he lived in day and night for six weeks. On the surface, you look at it and go, what's the problem? The problem is it looks like nobody's ever lived there. There's not an item of clothing. He was a pipe smoker. There were no books. There was no nothing. The bed was perfectly made. What there was on the carpet was part of a broken glass. And that is one of the few photos, just without any commentary, that is one of the very few photos in the Navy's investigative um, folder, which I, I show. Um, again, we're dealing with what would be called legally, um, um, it, it's all circumstantial evidence, but there is such a preponderance of it, and it fits so carefully together that I think if 
this could be taken before a jury, they would conclude beyond reasonable doubt that there was reason to, you know, um, investigate this as the homicide that it was. Well, right. well you, you know, know uh, 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 we've all- We've only got about two minutes left, Tim, so make it quick. No, no, I was just going to say, you know, this is not the only case uh, where uh, something very suspicious uh, happened. It was also the uh, case of Frank uh, Olson. Oh, sure. Out, yeah. yeah, who went out uh, a window. And, and uh, Tim wrote a book a, a few years ago on a, a mysterious assassinations and deaths and, uh, involving the government. And a lot of that will be in our uh, CIA matrix in the uh, mm. dark state. And no. uh, anyway, Peter, tell us where we can find anything that you have. <laughs> <laughs> um, right now, um, my um, website is woefully out of date, but it is um, my name and my home state, PeterRobbinsNY.com. I will have a new website up in the next few months and a couple of surprises to pass on to you guys within the next month of um turning a page in my career and moving on to uh, something that I hope will allow me to do what I've been doing for decades, but reach a wider audience. And um, I'm really quite excited about it. Otherwise, um, visit me on Facebook, um, where I always post what I'm doing. I was going to say where I'm going to be appearing next. I'll be appearing next in my living room. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, we got to laugh at this stuff or it's just, you know, uh, boy, oh boy. Yeah. But I'm just glad I'll, you guys. I'll, are, yeah. We, we got to do a Zoom. doing well. And I'm doing we well up do here a, in uh, the countryside. Zoom, I say. Uh, anyway, don't forget to uh, go to our YouTube uh, page while it's still up. That's Mr. UFO's uh, Secret Files. And you can find uh, me as uh, and, and Tim uh, on. Uh, uh, Facebook, but don't mention the conspiracy journal because we'll be uh, uh, taken down uh, again. And uh, go to Amazon.com uh, and uh, type in my name, uh, Timothy Beckley, and you'll find hundreds of books because we got almost 400 now, I believe, something like that. Right? Right on. You've been listening to Exploring the Bazaar with hosts Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz. They're taking back the night by jetting non-stop across the cosmos in search of the truly bizarre and totally unexplained, with you as their co-pilot. Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern, on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. For more information on exploring the bizarre and hosts Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz, check out their KCOR Digital Radio Network page. Follow their YouTube channel at MRUFO1100. Exploring the Bazaar.